So we might start as the numbers continue to come through. I want to start off by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the many lands in which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Also like to remind you this is an interactive session so you're welcome to ask questions at any point during the session. You can do so by using the chat function on the Zoom meeting. Uh, for those using screen readers, you can use the Alt-H keystroke and then type in the question from there. Uh, also to prompt you as well, our guest today is going to be going through and utilising a PowerPoint presentation. For those who don't uh, who, who can't see that, that's fine. Our presenter is going to be reading from that screen and will be able to provide prompts on what it is that is on that screen at any given time. Uh, if there is something that you do want to ask a question about, though, that you think might have been included on the screen, feel free to jump in with a question. So that kind of brings me to our guest today. Uh, Anna Glynn holds a Master of Applied Positive Psychology and a Professional Certificate in Positive Psychology and a Bachelor of Arts in Commerce and Arts. She's used this experience to run her own successful practice and exceeded in the financial services industry for a, a duration of 10 years. Uh, today's topic is a focus on resilience in these difficult times. It's never been more, uh, more of a prudent topic. Anna, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you for the introduction and hello to everyone. I won't say good afternoon because I'm not sure where everyone is based. Um, but yeah, looking forward to sharing some of what I know about resilience this afternoon. And as Jordan said, probably good timing on a topic that uh, yeah is quite important to each and every one of us whilst we're facing lockdown, which for many has been sort of an ongoing thing for the last 18 months. But you know, despite lockdown, you know, we all face challenges in our lives. In fact, that's kind of one of the inevitable things that is always going to come our way. So it's really important that we have the tools and the strategies to be able to be at our best as much as possible whilst we face those challenges. So hopefully what I'm going to share are things that you can apply straight away into your lives, or there might be things that you actually keep in your toolkit for the future when other things might arise. Now, what I'm going to share with you um, are a lot of uh, strategies that have come from research and science that have been undertaken, that have been shown to actually uh, improve resilience. So I'm not going to be talking about things that often people resort to, like, you know, online shopping or gambling or even, you know, increasing alcohol consumption which is some of the ways that people try to manage when they're facing a difficulty. But obviously none of those things actually have an impact on, on our resilience and how resilient we may be. So what I would love you to do, um, you know, thank you for dialing in and hopefully the next 60 minutes is going to be a big investment in yourself. So try and be as present as possible. Keep any of your to-do list to the side um, and really give, you, give yourselves that opportunity just to take on board what I'm saying and think about how you might be able to apply some of these things into your own life. Um, I'd love anyone that is able to pop, um, you know, comments or, or feedback in the chat. Jordan's also going to be capturing Q&A um, in, in the relevant section. And at the end of the session, we'll, we'll allow some time to answer any questions that you may have as well. So I thought I'd share um, my screen with you first, just to give a bit more of an introduction um, to myself and, and how I kind of got to be in front of you, I guess, uh, today as well. So um, I started off my career in the financial services industry, where I actually worked uh, for close to a decade, where I held a number of different roles. And it was at that time uh, where I was working when all of a sudden I was responsible for my team's well-being, their engagement, their resilience, and then, of course, how they were performing as well. Um, so despite going on lots of, you know, training and, and workshops, and I had some great coaches and mentors around, I didn't really feel like I had the knowledge or the skills to be able to drive those outcomes. So I did, started to do my own exploration and studies, and that's when I came across this field of positive psychology. Now, this might be something that is new to some of you or um, for others on the line, this might be a field that is, is quite familiar to them. So positive psychology, it's only been around for the last sort of 20 years. So don't, don't worry if you haven't heard of it. Um, but certainly in Australia where we're seeing a lot of this, um, the science from this space uh, coming into fruition is in our schools. 
So for anyone that has primary or secondary age students, your kids will be learning this, which is excellent. So positive education is huge in Australia. Also where we're seeing the principles being adopted is in our sporting codes. So for any NRL, AFL, tennis or swimming fans, maybe some you know that went to the Olympics as well, a lot of these players and um, coaches have been talking about some of these positive psychology principles, which is excellent to see. And where I do a lot of work is in the workplace setting as well. And we're starting to see more organisations understand the relationship between an employee's well-being, um, that being good for them, but also that being really good for the organisation as well. So my mission in my practice is to help uh, workplaces to bring the best out in the people and that people, their employees are better off having work there as well. Um, so that's sort of how I've come to be in front of each of you, having, um, you know, had that, uh, I guess, organisational um, work experience and then combining that with my studies to share more of those strategies um, that hopefully are going to help each of you drive your resilience as well. So given we are sort of talking about well-being and, and resilience and some of those affiliated topics, I thought where is always best to start is a bit of a check-in with yourself as well. So what I've got listed on the screen, and I am going to go through these in a little bit more detail shortly, is five typical states at the moment. So what you want, what I want you to do is as I read through each of these and explain and describe what they are, I'd love you just to think about how have you been feeling over the past month? Which of these five states would you actually select that most resonates with you as to how you've been feeling over the past four weeks? Now, I do a month because if I was to say today, given everything that's going on with lockdowns and, and everything else around the world, um, it probably wouldn't or might not be such a good um, representation of how you're feeling. So just think in general over the past month, how have I been feeling? So I'm going to start at the bottom of the screen. And this is when we talk about that state of burnt out or burnout. Now, this is when people are, you know, starting to feel really exhausted. Um, they've got low performance. There's very little energy and motivation. And they're really starting to feel quite negative towards their work. So the emoji that I've included there is basically this really sort of screwed up face at that point in time. That is how we'd sort of describe that burnt out category. When we move up next, the ladder, um, there's what's defined as the struggling category. So again, this is not a great state to be in. Um, people are feeling quite stressed. There's um, you know, a lot of anxiety around. They're probably starting to be quite absent in their work or in their life. And because of that, they, they tend to experience much poorer performance as well. Um, and this category is typically at most at risk of burnt out. And that's where we've got that emoji of a really sad face there. If we move up to the next level, we have this state called languishing. Now, this is a state that's very much resonated with a lot of people of late. So these are those feelings of feeling quite meh or blah, um, where you're feeling quite demotivated each day, you're easily distracted, it's hard to focus, and you're starting to feel a bit fatigued and that stress is starting to build up. Um, so again, that's going to start to have a bit of, of, of impact on how productive or how you're performing. Um, and so with that emoji, I've sort of given it that sort of half, um, half frown there. So it's a bit of a mm, sort of feeling. Next up is um, those that are functioning. So these are the people that, you know, despite what's going on, they still tend to be performing quite well. They're being productive and they're quite focused. So they're, they're, they're doing pretty well. And they've just got, a, a, as, a, as a state to describe them, a smile on their face. And then the top of the ladder, we have those that are thriving. So these are people that you know, are performing really well despite what's going on. And they're doing that because they're really resilient. They have the tools to cope. They're really engaged in their work and their life. They've got great well-being and they're typically quite committed to their organisation as well. So these people are thriving. They have big, huge smiles on, on their faces. So as I said, what as I've been going through, what I'm hoping each of you has been doing is just starting to do a bit of self-reflection on how you might be feeling or how you have been feeling over the past month. 
So what I'd love you to do is just write that down. And for anyone that would like to, you're more than welcome to, to share perhaps that state that you might have been feeling um, in, in the chat. However, I totally understand that, that it can be quite a confidential thing that you might want to keep to yourself as well. So based on the state that you're in, now what you want to do is just start to think about, well, what impact is that having on, on me and the way you are showing up in the world? or perhaps those around you, so your, your colleagues or even your family members, um, you know, just start to think about, well, based on how I'm feeling, what, what impact do I think I'm having? So typically we're finding a, a vast majority of people are sitting in that languishing category. In fact, some of the researchers would suggest this is the dominant state for 2021, is people are feeling like they're languishing. What's most important to note with this category is to move up. So obviously the intention is to start feeling better. The first thing we probably need to think about is, is building those coping skills, which is all around our resilience. And the same goes for those struggling or burnt out. We really need to build the coping skills so we can get back to either that functioning or what's best, that thriving state. Now, for anyone that is feeling that way, struggling, burnt out or languishing, I please strongly advise you to seek some sort of help, whether that's from your employer or from professional service providers. It's really important that you take action there to try and help yourself move up that ladder as well. Now, my intention or certainly what I hope most people would aim for is thriving. Um, you know, it sounds pretty good to me to be up there. But also, um, I guess what's important to note is that thriving is not just a destination that we reach and we settle there. It's something that does take a lot of um, ongoing actions and commitments too to enable ourselves to be at that state as well. And there's some of the things that I'm going to share in this session as well as we go. All right, so let's move on now and start to talk a bit more about well, how can we build this resilience? How can we start to move closer towards thriving? Now, again, before I delve into it, I'd love people just to have a bit of a think as when I say the words resilience, what kind of pops to mind? And again, I um, would love you to just write those down on um, a note paper or something in front of you and happy for people to pop into the chat. What comes to mind when I say those words resilience? So I'm going to share with you um, one of my favorite definitions of resilience, which talks about this positive adaptation in the face of adversity or risk. So it's about positive adaptation. That's what I love. So it's about taking sort of action to overcome those challenges. A school of thought that exists at the moment as well talks about resilience, yes, as a bounce back. So often when I ask people what they, they think when I say resilience, they say, well, I've sort of been going along and I've dipped because of something that's happened and then I've, I've bounced back. There's this new school of thought that actually takes this one step further. They talk about resilience, yes, as a bounce back, but as a bounce forward. And I really like this because it gives that idea that because of what we've gone through, we've come out much stronger or we've grown or developed in some way. And I like to think about resilience in that way because if we think about the last 18 months, and what we've gone through, I could guarantee that every single person will be able to talk to something new that they've developed or grown having gone through this experience. Take, for example, us delivering you know, presentations online or, or getting familiar with video tech, conferencing technology as a new skill that the majority of us would have developed over the last 18 months. So yes, resilience is a bounce back, but a bounce forward too. All right, so let's start to talk a bit about, well, what does the research then suggest are the things that enable us to be resilient? And again, as I go through these or just now as, as I'm talking, I want you to think about, well, what makes me resilient? Because each and every one of you are resilient. So what are some of those things that you draw upon or you've got that you believe are the things that make you resilient? And I'm going to talk you through what some of the research suggests to us are the, the key elements that drive people's resilience. Okay, so what I've got listed on the screen here is a range of different elements that the researchers have found lead to greater resilience. And I'm going to take you through each of these now. So at the top of um, the circle that's on the screen, 
biology is listed. So this might be a, a good thing or a bad thing for some people, but our biology, you know, our genes, the way we're made up as humans very much has a, a role to play in how resilient we are in terms of how we cope with our stress. But that's not something I'm going to delve into too much time today because that's probably an area that's actually outside of my, my expertise. But what's listed next in that circle is strong relationships. So human beings, we're you know, social creatures, we need other people to survive. And that's why can, our connections are really important for our resilience. The thing, they're people, the people we draw upon in times of need. So that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail in this session is how we strengthen our connections with others, particularly whilst we're apart from one another. Next um, listed on the slide is optimism. So optimism is one of the critical ingredients of resilience, which is all about how we think about the future or how we explain the past. And because of that thought pattern, that actually drives the type of actions that we take in the present. So optimism is a critical factor in resilience. Also the ability to problem solve. That, so that's what's listed next on the slide. Our, um, you know, our ability to actually come up with solutions to our problems is is important in resilience um, and hopefully that, that kind of makes um, a lot of, of sense why. Next what's listed is self-regulation. So this is all about our, our ability to actually calm ourselves down in times of you know, high stress or anxiety and that's a really important factor in resilience. Next up we've got positive emotions. We're going to delve into this topic in a bit more detail and it's one of my favourites because the research has suggested that the more positivity we experience in the present, the more resilient we are in the future. And I think that's some good news for everyone. Next up, what's listed is strengths. So people that are quite resilient are known to actually use their strengths. So they know what they are and they're able to apply them um, in, in, their, in their worlds as well. And last but not least, what's listed is cognitive flexibility, which is basically just a, a way of saying the ability of ourselves to control our thoughts, which is a great skill to master and is really important in resilience. So that they are some of the, as I said, common ingredients that the researchers have found lead to resilience. Often I ask people, well, what's missing? Like, what are some of the things that you might use that aren't listed there? Um, I guess what's, what's missing, um, which is maybe good news to people, is that age and gender is missing, um, which I think is great. Finally, there's something where age and gender don't, don't play a role. What also is missing is, um, you know, religion or, or spirituality in some, some shape or form. So having that kind of higher purpose, I think that's really important for resilience and certainly is something that can, um, you know, keep people motivated and focused during difficult times. Um, also, what's missing is our previous experiences. So as I said earlier, you know, we would hope that because we've gone through something challenging, we've grown as a result of that. And that's absolutely going to make us more resilient in the future. So hopefully some of the things that you reflect, reflected upon at the start that help you be resilient are some of those things that um, are listed on those screens that I've spoken about. So now what we're going to do is actually delve into some of those strategies that we can use that are going to help us be more resilient. So the first we're going to talk about is how we best direct our focus. So my first question, and you're lucky that I can't see your faces in this webinar. I'll always ask, where's your mind currently? Is it actually on me or is it off wandering thinking about dinner already? Now, as much as it hurts me, um, you know, I can't be, get angry or upset if people say to me, oh, yeah, I was thinking about dinner or what's happening next. Because what research tells us is that 40% of our day, our mind is wandering. So almost half of our days when our mind is meant to be focused on something, it's thinking about something else. So our focus is a really finite resource. And we need to try and actually work out ways that we can direct it to areas that are going to help us, um, you know, be better and feel better and do better during challenging times, as opposed to thinking about all the things that are not going to have um, a positive impact on us. So um, Rota um, came up with this concept of the two circles. So what I've got listed on the screen here, and I'm going to go through it in a bit more detail, is an inner circle, which is called your circle of influence, and then an outer circle that's called the circle of concern. 
So what Rotter um, suggested is that proactive people tend to focus on all the things that are in their influence as opposed to things that are outside of their control. Now, for any Stephen Covey fans on the line, um, he also spoke about this concept in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So how this sort of works, and this is, again, something that you might want to um, draw on a piece of paper in front of you or even just come up with two lists. So basically, there are a whole lot of things that keep us up at night, um, cause us a lot of stress, um, but they're actually outside of our control when we really think about them. So these are things like the weather or a natural disaster or, you know, things like the government restrictions. Yes, they have an impact on us, but they're actually outside of our control. So there's really no point in, in actually spending too much time thinking about them. Same as the actions of others, the thoughts of others, even technology, you know, things that can really concern us, but outside of our control. So what we want to try and do is shift our focus to all the things that we can control, because that's actually going to help us manage our stress and it's going to actually boost our resilience and help us feel better and do better during challenging times. So in that inner circle, our circle of influence, are all the things we can control. Now, typically, or the vast majority are going to be things attributed to your thoughts, your actions, or your feelings, because they're really the only things that we have a control over. So what I've listed on that inner circle is some of the things that I do. And again, they're going to be some of the things we discuss. But things within our control when we are facing difficult times are, you know, our connections with other people. Um, time spent on media, you know, the media at the moment, unfortunately, is just full of such negative stories. And that really drains our energy. So we've got to think about our consumption of the media and what's best for us. You know, our mindset, um, rest and recovery is so important. Being kind to others, um, trying to find a way to have a big laugh. These are all things within our control that we can that can help us feel better. Same as expressing gratitude, practicing mindfulness, being kind exercising, you know, using our strengths or having a really good routine in place. All the things that are inside of our control that are actually going to help us feel better. And so, for the yeah. purpose of uh, breaking down, how, how would you sort of determine, like, do you have some questions that you have in mind when you are determining which things are or aren't in your control? Yeah, good, good question, Jordan. And that's, I guess, the action, um, what I was just about to say is very much that. So, um, you know, have a think, and it might be the end of each day, or, or when you are feeling a bit, um, you know, stressed and anxious, perhaps once that's gone, that time has passed. Just think about, well, what, what was your mind actually focused on? And then you've got to stop and question, is that actually something I can control? Or is it something I can't control? And the, the skill to master is that you've got to try and shift that focus back to things that you can control. And that's where actually having this somewhere, um, you know, handy, like, you know, some people that I speak to actually have it printed out um, on the wall in front of them as that constant reminder throughout the day of, you know, having your focus where it should be on all the things you can control. So again, the, the things you can control will most likely come back to your thoughts, your actions, your feelings. So try and come up with your own lists and keep building them over time, obviously. And the idea is that we want to have a much longer list of all the things we can control versus the things that we can't control that might not be, um, you know, uh, causing us a bit of stress. Does that answer that question, Jordan? Yeah, perfectly. And especially for people um, that aren't able to put something in front of themselves for the visualization practice, just going through it in your, in your mind, you know, I can't control this because, or I can control this because, and just thinking out at least, as you said, even two or three points in their own mind regarding why they can or can't control something, uh, goes a long way to sort of narrowing the field, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. And that's it. It's it's a trick we have to try and play with our brains. It comes back to that idea of that cognitive flexibility where we've got to try and control those thoughts. I mean, difficult to master takes a lot of time and effort, but well worth it in the end. Um, and it is just, you know, the way I use it now is it's not a visual for me. It's just that reminder of if I find myself thinking about something or overthinking about something or catastrophizing something in my head, you've got to stop and go, is this something I can control? And just that question will help you then um, group where, where that particular factor is going to sit. 
I imagine a, a lot of sort of breathing exercises and meditation and mindfulness sort of leads into this sort of thing as well. Absolutely. Yes, very much so. Yeah, very good. All right. So hopefully that's a good first strategy for people to take away from here. That is something that you might think about. How can I best apply this um, in my world? So next up, we're going to talk about my favorite topic, as I said, which is boosting positivity, which I think is really um, interesting and probably quite cool from the research that's done, um, where the more positive emotions we experience in the present, the more resilient we are. And I'm going to take you through that in a bit more detail. But first off, again, I just want you to reflect upon what are the things that make you feel good? So what are you doing when you feel that influx of positive emotions or positivity? You know, who are you with? What are you doing? What are those good times? Just think about some of those. And again, might want to pop them in the, into the chat or just list them somewhere as well, just to be um, that reminder. So positive emotions are so good for us. I mean, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. But, um, you know, the research will show they help us um, be happier, healthier mentally and physically. They help us to be more optimistic and they also undo the negative effects of stress. So if you've gone through a stressful period, one of the great strategies to do is have a big laugh or do something that actually boosts that positivity in your lives. Now, um, so the way the, the kind of science or the research behind it works, a lady by the name of Barbara Fredrickson, who is listed on the screen, has spent decades studying emotions. So what she's found from her research is that when we experience those positive emotions in the present, it's almost like they go into a savings account at the bank and over time they build up. And in the future, we can draw them out when we're facing challenging times because they come out as res uh, resilience. So the way that kind of works, because I know it's kind of a bit um, intense, the way I'm describing it, is that you experience a positive emotion in the present it goes into a savings bank because it's a positivity you're experiencing your your mind is broadened so you actually become more creative more innovative and more able to problem solve when you're in a positive state of mind compared to a negative and because of that in the future those positive emotions turn into resilience so if you don't remember any of those things just think the more positive emotions i experience the better i'm going to be when i next face a challenge but there is a ratio. So Fredrickson would suggest that for every one negative emotion we experience, we have to have three positive emotions to compensate. And that's because a lot of the data will tell us that bad is stronger than the good. So the magic ratio is three to one. Now, again, just start to think about our days at the moment and think, am I meeting that ratio? So for every negative emotion I experience, am I having three times as many as positive? Now, typically when I ask people that, they're not coming anywhere near to that. And again, there's reasons why that's happening. And the first is because we've got so much news, like a 24-hour news cycle in front of us that is just full of negative emotions. So um, we want to think about how we consume the media. Now, for people, it might be first thing in the morning or it might be the last thing at night. But if you're someone that has notifications turned on their phones, chances are that constantly throughout your day, you're just going to be interrupted with negative news stories, particularly as, you know, um, the pandemic is looming and, you know, we've got those events in Afghanistan happening at the moment. Every time you're trying to do something and you get that notification, your mind is distracted. If you read that notification, it's negative. It is 100% more difficult to come back with the same level of focus as you had prior to getting that notification. So it's a big disruptor in your day. So just think about how you're consuming the media, what media you're consuming as well. And that also goes for social media as well. So we want to try and limit the negative emotions to help boost up our one to three ratio. So then we need to think about, well, how do we boost the positivity in our lives? First thing that I'm going to cover here is sparking kindness. So kindness is one of those things um, that's really um, amazing because when we're kind to someone else, it makes us feel really good, but it also makes them feel really good too. And kindness is contagious. So when people witness it, 
they're more inclined to share it on. And hopefully what that means is there's going to be a much more kinder world in the future. And if anyone belongs to kind of the Kindness Pandemic Facebook group, that's a good one on social media to belong to. There's lots of incredible stories of how people are being kind during the pandemic. So right now, you know, what we can be thinking about is how can we do some small things for people around us? That, you know, kindness doesn't have to be big audacious gestures like bunches of flowers and all big dinners and those sorts of things. You know, in my neighbourhood, we've started cooking for one another. So, you know, on a regular occurrence, uh, whether I like it or not, um, I get, you know, scones baked by some kids in the street um, and we, we bake pies. We, you know, there's a lot of sharing of, of meals and cooking and that's only started during the pandemic. But for others, you know, it can just be things like sending a text message just to let someone know that you're thinking of them um, or a letter or picking a bunch of flowers or even just buying, you know, a coffee and paying it forward to the person behind you. There's some really small ways that we can all try, be trying to be more kind in this world. And as I said, you know, it's good for others, good for us, but then hopefully it's going to create a much kinder world as well. Next up, I want to talk about one of the mega strategies for being happier and having greater well-being and resilience, which is all around gratitude. So, again, um, you know, our, our worlds are kind of, um, you know, littered with the negative. And that's, be, or I guess, the, the reason why we pay more weight to the negative than the positive is because of this thing called the negativity bias. And this will be familiar to some of the people on the line. But because of this negativity bias, it's often hard for us to be grateful for all the things that we do have. And again, like it makes in, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense, right? You know, we should be more grateful. But because of this bias, often it's hard for us to do that because we scan our environments for all the things we don't have in them, as opposed to all the things we do. So the, the strategy that I'm going to suggest here is called three good things. Now, again, if you have children um, at school, they've probably been taught this, um, but it's a gratitude exercise that asks you maybe even around the dinner table at night with your family, um, but at an, at an individual level, you can do it just before you go to sleep in bed. But it asks you to think about three things you're grateful for and why you're grateful for them. And the ask is to write them down. The next day or night, you complete that exercise, but you think of three different things you're grateful for and why you're grateful for them. So over time, basically, you're starting to build this long list of all the things that you're grateful for. What's really interesting about the studies that have been done in this space is that after 21 days, so just three weeks of doing this, your brains start to rewire themselves and they start. it starts to look for all the positive in your world, all the things you do have, as opposed to the things that you don't have. After 42 days, they found outcomes like you're less likely to be sick, you have more energy, you're happier, you're more focused, you're more enthusiastic, optimistic, you have better sleep and lower levels of depression and anxiety. Just by practicing that one little activity that's probably going to take you about five minutes if you do it by yourself. So it is the mega strategy for being happier, greater well-being and, and being more resilient is thinking about all the things that we have. So being grateful. And last but not least, I want to talk a bit about humour. So I've kind of I've kind of mentioned it. Um, you know, humour. You know, it, it makes us laugh. It it don't. I, I guess some people think of humour as maybe um, uh, uh, like the wrong strategy to use at challenging times, but it's actually a really healthy coping mechanism. Um, it's it can just be a good distraction from what can be a pretty grim reality that we're all facing at the moment. Um, and obviously, there's a right time and a right place for humour. But this could just be something as simple as, you know, sharing a funny YouTube clip or meme, an appropriate one at work, please. Um, you know, a joke with someone, you know, a, a, a fun playlist, whatever it is, but just help make yourself laugh and others laugh around you too. Because we know that there are so many um, mental health and physical health benefits from doing so, but then also it contributes to our well-being and our resilience as well. So that's um, a, a a bit of a section or some content based all around the importance of positivity in terms of being resilient. And I explained how, how, you know, enjoying positive emotions in the present builds resilience. But the other key message is that one to three, one to three, um, you know, for every one negative emotion, we've got to be boosting up those positive emotions. So when I think about decreasing the negative in whatever way we can and absolutely upping those positive emotions as much as possible as well. 
All right. Really good advice, Anna. Can I just ask a question yes. just in regards to um, showing gratitude? I think I've come across a couple of people in, in my lifetime that will often look at, uh, I'm grateful that I've got this and there are plenty of other people that don't have that. I guess in this particular point in time, that can often make some people feel like it's not okay to be not well. It's not okay to be, to, to be not okay uh, on any given day. What sort mm. of advice would you have for something like that? Yeah, so I guess that's a bit of a like perspective discussion, and it is really interesting. And again, you know, there there was studies done last year or um, surveys done where you know people in Australia were feeling pretty pretty bad you know towards the end of the year when when things weren't going so great we were seeing you know mental health issues come up but then when we started to hear a lot more about what was happening in India and we saw really the you know severity of what COVID had done there it was interesting that in the surveys we actually saw less people reporting um issues or or impacts to their to their mental health so absolutely was still present but what the um, researchers were suggesting is that because then all of a sudden we had this different perspective of what was going on, it, it tended to us to, to suddenly be more grateful for the circumstances that we were in. It was a bit of a, I'm so lucky to live in Australia where we're not living overseas, a bit like what's happening in Afghanistan right now. So perspective does play a big role in it. And it's, it's not, uh, I guess, something that, you know, it's not a boastful exercise or strategy, but it's actually just what's showing is that when we suddenly have that different perspective, we can start to feel more grateful for what we do have, perhaps perhaps how we didn't feel prior to that. I hope that makes sense. I think so. Okay, good. Very good. All right. So let's move along now to, to the last sort of um, area that I wanted to talk about, which, you know, is all about our relationships. So as I said, this is a critical time, uh, or it's a critical element for our resilience. So I want you to think about um, your relationships and perhaps what was the what's been a recent interaction you've had with someone that really lit you up. So you you know you, perhaps you engage with someone and you you suddenly were more energized or, or you felt better. Just think as I go through what were some of the things that were um, present or evident in that interaction which made you feel that way? Because it's just always good to reflect upon. Well, why did I feel so good from being with that person or having that interaction? So relationships are fundamental to us as human beings. We know, you know, we see it in Maslow's hierarchy of needs that, you know, there's that sense of belonging. Um, and even, you know, just if we think about, you know, survival, you know, we needed other people to survive, um, you know, throughout the ages of time, particularly since, you know, the start of sort of civilization as well. So when we were asked to physically separate ourselves from one another, you know, probably now over a year ago, we knew this was going to have a negative impact on us. Um, and in particular, there was a big push to, to change a lot of the language that was present at the time, which was all about, you know, physically distancing or social isolation and those sorts of terms. Um, so there was a big push in um, the messaging from the government to be physical distancing with social connection because we knew that if, if people were thinking about social isolation, that that was just going to have a massive negative impact on them. So as I said, we, we very much need to think about, well, yes, we might be physically apart, but how can we still keep those, um, those connections or relationships, um, you know, connected and of, of a high quality? So some of the things to think about have come from a research by Jane Dutton, who's listed on the screen, who spent like three decades looking at relationships. In particular, she talks about relationships at work. And there's some of the things that we can think about, you know, are our relationships at home or those in a professional sense as well. So one of the first things Jane talks about is this idea that we have to respectfully engage with others. Now, again, this makes intuitive sense, right? Of course, we want to respectfully engage with the other person that's in front of us but so often we can get that wrong. Um, and I'm sure each of you can probably think of some examples when you know the person in front of you is probably disrespecting you as opposed to respecting you. So this is when small acts matter. You know, we want to exemplify behaviour that the other person exists. So we want to be, you know, present. We're listening effectively. Our phones are not in sight. You know, we're communicating supportingly. It's all about, you know, how can we 
display to them through just small acts that, that we respect them. Next is all around, you know, being compassionate, particularly at this point in time. Um, you know, as I said, um, human beings, you know, we're drawn to others in times of need because they're actually like a support system for us. Um, but when we want to think about sort of compassion is so often when someone's telling us their problems, we want to jump to solution mode. And again, I'm sure many of you have witnessed this where you just want to have a big download and the person's just trying to come up with all these answers to your problems. Um, but what we really need to show by being compassionate is that that person is being listened to and they're being heard because often that's all they want in that moment. They actually don't want a solution. They just want to be listened to. This is where I heard um, a really great tip, which was, you know, the golden rule is to treat others the way we want to be treated, but the platinum rule is treat others the way they wish to be treated. So just thinking about, you know, as particularly as we all sort of um, endure this, this difficult time in different ways, what is it that that other person actually needs or what are they asking for as opposed to what you might need at that time? That also leads into that sort of trust piece. So, you know, trust is a fundamental of relationships. Again, we all, we all know this. But how do we display trust or how do we build trust? Because it's something that can be very quickly eroded um, and takes a longer time to actually build as well. So some of the things that we can do here is, you know, sharing our vulnerabilities. And again, that's sort of been almost a silver lining of the last 18 months is that we've seen more people be open about the way they're feeling and perhaps some of those struggles. But that's where we've got to make sure that we trust people to do that. Um, you know, eroding trust is easily done by um, not doing what we say we're going to do but also by building trust, we've got to, you know, make sure that we're walking the talk and doing all the things that we said we we're going to do as well. It's a very um, good way to help, you know, build trust by acting consistently as well. Um, last but not least, you know, we need to have some play. So again, we've spoken about positive emotions and the importance of them there. Um, but I think at this point in time, it's really important that we have fun with other people. It's a great way to learn, um, you know, about someone else. It's a great way to form connections. It's also a great way to boost those positive emotions that's going to help us be more resilient. So something else that, you know, often we neglect during difficult times, but really important to also um, prioritise as well. So perhaps four sort of different things that maybe when you were reflecting upon what made a recent interaction energizing for you, maybe it was some of these things that were listed here, maybe it was others. But again, they all kind of intuitively make sense, but sometimes we forget them. So it's just a good reminder about, well, what are those things that actually helps us strengthen those connections even, and they're things we can do when we're physically apart from others as well. All right. So last but not least, so that was sort of the, um, the, the main part of the content, but I guess just a couple of little things I wanted to cover um, is, you know, just this idea about, you know, we need to recover from stress. So we've all gone through a lot of stress. In fact, our bodies and brains have kind of been in survival mode for 18 months, which was never, never the intention. We were never meant to be there for long periods of time. So if anyone is feeling like a bit like a depleted battery, it's really important that we think about the ways that we actually build those batteries back up. Now, you'll each have your different ways of doing this. And the things I'm going to share, again, are the things that we all know. But I just want you to think about what are the one percenters you might be able to do for each of these that's just going to help you be a little bit more better over time. So the first one is sleep. So we know sleep is um, absolutely a priority, not a luxury. But often this is off the first thing that can get neglected. Now, you know how long you're meant to sleep for. Um, but as I said, you know, for a 1% better, how can you make your sleep maybe that much, a little bit more improved? Is it going to bed earlier? Is it keeping your phone out of your room so you don't spend another half an hour, hour on social media before you go to bed? What is it that you can just improve it by 1% more? And I'm sure everyone can do that. Same goes for nutrition. So how can we, you know, eat better or um, drink less alcohol or eat less fatty foods just to improve our nutrition, just that 1% better. There's a direct link between our gut health and our mental health. So we just want to think about all the things that we're putting in our body. For a 1% are better, could it be one less glass of wine, one less beer, rather than going for the donut at three o'clock, let's go for the green tea instead. What are those 1%ers you could do? 
Next up is exercise. Again, exercise is so important um, in stressful times. It, it, when we don't exercise, it's like taking a depressant and doing exercise is like an antidepressant. So what are the one percenters that you could do to boost your exercise? Is it going for a walk, um, you know, if possible and restrictions allow, um, in the sunshine, without the phone, um, doing it with a friend if that's allowed or someone in your household, but just something to help you, you do that exercise. And last but not least is this idea of mindfulness. So mindfulness can be undertaken in a number of different ways. It's not just meditation. There's some really incredible apps out there that can help support you if mindfulness isn't something you've done, but it can be just simple breathing exercises as well, or just directing your focus on something. And they can be done when you brush your teeth, when you're driving, even just savoring your coffee as you drink it in the morning is a form of mindfulness. So I'm um, happy to share more suggestions or apps that can support you in that, but a really good skill to master to help recover from stress as well. All right, so I'm going to leave you with this final quote before we open up to questions, but basically just a good reminder, you know, that in life, um, yes, we're going to come across all these challenges and that the most important thing is for us to get back up again. And that's how we should be judging success, not by, you know, all the things we've achieved, but how many challenges we've gone through and we've overcome. So hopefully you've picked up some strategies or tools that you can put into your toolkit and use straight away, as we said, once you leave this session, or there might be things that you share with others or things you draw upon um, in, in the future as well. Now, my contact details are there for anyone that does want to ask a question, perhaps direct to me. And I'm also on you know, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn as well, where I sort of regularly share tips and tricks from this, this space for anyone that would like to stay in touch. So I'll stop sharing there. And I'm thinking that Jordan might have some questions for me as well. I do. Um, so we did have uh, some feedback regarding um, people that are languishing at this particular point in time, as you probably, as you touched on as well, that it is a rather common thing that is happening at this point in time. Mm. Um, do you have uh, some of your, what, what's some of your wisdom around helping recognise when somebody is languishing and, and how do we snap ourselves forward from it? Yes. Great question. Yes. And exactly that. Um you know, it's it's a state that um, has always sort of been there, but it, it was perhaps just grown in the number of people that have been feeling this way most recently. And when I've shared it with others, they're like, oh, my gosh, finally there's a word to describe how I'm feeling. Um, and it's languishing um, first came about by a man by Corey Keyes who spoke about the mental health spectrum. And if you've got sort of mental illness at one end and thriving and flourishing at the other he suggests that languishing is sort of in the middle. So you don't have a diagnosable mental illness, but you're not feeling your best. So you are starting to really feel depleted, fatigued. The stress and anxiousness is getting to you and it's having it's starting to have an impact on your life. Um, so as I said, like any of those states, I think the first thing is building those coping skills, like what we've just spoken about, because um, clearly we've probably used all the things from our toolkit in the past and now that's why we need a refresher on, well, what are some other strategies we can be trying because we've almost like exhausted everything perhaps that we used to use because we have been in this state for so long and it was never intended for us to be under this much stress for such a long period of time. So absolutely try some of these things in this strategy to help um, in this uh, session to help build yourself up, build those resilience coping skills. But of course, please seek um, additional support if needed from various um, professional service providers as well. I answered and I will, uh, I did touch on early on in the session that if you do have a question, please use the chat function on the Zoom chat function. And you can also use that chat function by using this keystroke alt H if you are using a screen reader. Uh, we are getting closer to the end of our session here. So the sooner you get those questions in, the sooner we can ask them. I guess I've got a question in regards to managing work-life balance. Uh, I understand at this point in time, and you, you and I are both from the financial services district, and they used to have a clear divide of, of when you were at work and when you weren't. Uh, that's become a little bit more blurred at this point in time. Uh, what's some of the tips that you would recommend for something like that? 
Yes, yes. There's no work life anymore. It's just this big mush. Um, and that's why I feel like time is sort of going very quickly because there isn't that divide almost between our personal and professional lives. So my biggest um, suggestion for, you know, to manage this is um, setting up that routine. So what is your work routine? What is your home routine? If you're working from home, think about how you can still put in a, a start and end time, regular breaks, a lunch break, and have a space if you can that's dedicated to work. Um, so you don't want to have people working from you know the couch or the living room as much as possible. I, I appreciate that some people don't have um, the ability to separate so much. But if you're someone um, that maybe can't differentiate those zones, if you will, you know I know people that you know in the morning they get up, get dressed, go for a walk around the block, and that puts them into work zone like they were commuting to work. Then they start their day. And at the end of the day, same thing. There is something in their brains to distinguish that work is finished and home life has started. Um, Adam Fraser, who is an organisational psychologist in New South Wales, talks a lot about a third space. And that's what our commutes were really good for. It was that, um, that boundary between work and home. But because that's gone, we need to try and think of how we can replicate that in the best way possible in our, in our new lives and having that routine so it's not just you know, our days just drag on and we keep working without having that proper end time in place. Well answered. Uh, another, another thing to sort of ask is in regards to the term, we, we have been hearing a bit more of the term uh, lockdown fatigue. Uh, so if you're, if you're putting these new activities or habits into, into practice, um, how do you sort of continue to keep yourself on task with that sort of thing? Yeah, so again, that lockdown fatigue is that just that um, I guess it's the compound of so much prolonged stress. So our bodies have basically been in like fight, flight, freeze for 18 months um, because of ongoing uncertainty. You know, we don't have anything to look forward to. So, yeah, it, it all starts to, um, you know, come about as, as fatigue, that, that feeling even though we're probably getting a bit more sleep or maybe not. But, yes, definitely just those feelings of exhaustion. So. It's just putting those positive energizers into your day. So thinking about what boosts positivity, um, you know, all those things that are inside your control, prioritizing those. Um, if they are mood boosters, they're going to make you feel better. So focus on those and reduce all those other things that don't bring you that good energy. So if it's the news, get off it. Um, you know, you will get your own updates, um, but just try and get that balance right between decreasing the negative emotions, boosting the positivity because it comes with all those great benefits like feeling better, more energised, more motivated, more focused. Um, so just think about all those things that it is that you can do. Uh, and, and for those who are raising families at this particular point in time, uh, one thing I've noticed is that there's always an arm dragging on you asking how somebody should feel at this particular point in time. So for children that are struggling as well, we're dealing with the, the new circumstance that they're in. Uh, advice, resources? Yeah, so I think it's it's normalising it, right? So just like us, we've had to normalise the idea that, um, you know, different emotional states are just how we feel right now. And it's it, it, when you think about why we feel that way, it starts to make a lot more sense. So I think with children, it's the same thing. It's normalising that, that that is okay to feel that way. But we want to try and look at some ways that we can make things feel better. Um, and that's, again, thinking about all the all the tools and strategies we've discussed um, and limiting their exposures to those that negative negativity or the negative and trying to boost more of the positive. And, of course, there's a lot more complexity when it comes to kids and them not being able to go to school, see their friends, et cetera. But, yeah, finding ways that hopefully they can do that um, in the interim as well. But yeah, I think normalizing as much as possible in terms of resources, you know, there's a lot out there. Um, you know, there's kids helpline, which has some great resources online, um, et cetera. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of information available. Perfect. Well, we're getting close to the end of the webinar. So I might take the opportunity, Anna, to thank you so much for joining us and for, uh, and providing all of this information that you've no doubt garnered over a lengthy period of time. Uh, where, for the purpose of people that weren't able to read the screen, where can we find you? 
Oh, good, good one. Um, uh, well, definitely I am on Facebook, so you can look me up, Anna Glynn, um, and then on LinkedIn or um, Instagram as well. I had to think of what that last one was called. Um, but yes, uh, and I, if you go onto my website, you can sign up to a blog where I regularly sort of share lots of the research and studies that are coming out um, and translate some of that research into more relatable strategies for people. So yes, happy for anyone to connect or of course, um, you know, we can share my email or phone number after if anyone would like to have perhaps more of a private um, question asked, et cetera. Perfect. And what we'll do is we'll send out a bit of information um, to the people that have come along today and to the people that registered and weren't able to join us with a bit of your information. Uh, thank you, Leanne. That's <laughs> thank you for your presentation, Anna, from, from Leanne. Uh, but look, I'd, I'd probably take this time at the moment once again to thank Anna for all of her time. If we have a final question, we might uh, we might decide to uh, to end the webinar there. Sure. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I hope everyone found that that session valuable. And of course, I wish you all the best going forward as well. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.